Hello, my name is Dr. George Sparks, and you are watching Bible Interact TV. We have a, an exciting program that we're going to share with you today. It is about an Egyptian outpost that was discovered about 20 years ago, and kind of by accident because of certain artifacts that actually reached the antiquity market, and some archaeologists actually saw these items, and one of the Bedouins who brought those particular artifacts to a dealer to show them where they found these artifacts. Uh, we got some very similar that we're going to share with you today. The location is actually called Der El Bala. And it is a, 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 an Egyptian outpost during the 18th and 19th dynasties of Egypt. Okay? So the reason why it's an outpost is because because it's along what we call the Levant, the coastline going through uh, Canaan, or later we would call, call it Israel. But going from the north to south in the Egyptian uh, time, uh, it is referred to as the Way of Horus. So we're going to look at an Egyptian outpost. So Deir Abala on the Way of Horus. Now remember the Roman period, we call it the Via Mars, the Way by the Sea. But the Egyptian period, the way of Horus. Here we have a little map, and on it, we're going to orient ourselves. We have Tyre, Akko, Tel Dor. Look to the right of Dor, you'll see Megiddo, then Shechem below that. If we go a little bit further south, we have Jerusalem. So if you have an idea of where Jerusalem is in the land of Israel, orient, orient yourself. Then we got Joppa. Uh, Joppa is very, very close to Tel Aviv. When you land and go on a tour, you're going to probably stay a night very close to Joppa. Then we got Gezer, Ashkelon. We're going to move further south now to show you, on the way of horse, six outposts which have now been identified. These are Egyptian outposts. So we stopped with Gaza. Then we have Darabala. That's the site we're going to look at. That's the one that was actually you could say, discovered by chance because the antiquities reached a certain uh, eye of certain scholars and they wanted to identify with um, the location where these were found. Very important. Uh, one of the scholars was Trudy Dothan. Now I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story. I went to a, uh, a lecture in Israel. I was at a friend's uh, house and uh, he's an antiquity dealer. And he said, hey, George, you want to go to a lecture on archaeology? And I said, well, sure. And we took off. We did this quick little jog. And by the time we got there, we were running a little late, probably because we're, I'm from New Mexico, the land of manana. But we arrived a little late. The lights were out. We found some chairs, sat down, and listened to about an hour lecture on an archaeological site. Okay? When the lights came back up on, okay, sitting right next to me was that lady, Trudy Dotan. She is the queen of what we call the Philistine antiquities, the, the, the knowledge of the Philistines in the land of Israel. So a friend was asking uh, Professor Dothan uh, for some bichrome Philistine shards. And I, I asked her, I said, have you uh, spoke to this gentleman that's been asking you for shards? Uh, and he goes, oh, yes. He bugs me every week. And um, I tell you what, so he bugged her every week. But then when I got home, he gave me several Philistine shards that arrived that he was requesting from this lady, this professor. So uh, this was brought to my attention, and uh, she seemed like she's a little frustrated. But, you know, um, it helps to be persistent in life, put it that way. This is what we call in, you could say, archaeology, in Egyptology, it's a Ushapti. The Shapti answers the deceased. It's kind of like a, um, a charm device. What happens is, is the deceased um, would have uh, in their tomb one Ushapti, possibly for every day of the year if they were wealthy enough. They would be somewhat small. And then there would be another Ushapti bigger than that, which would be a supervisor Ushapti to keep those little ones in order. 
Now, why would certain individuals have you shop these in their tombs? Well, if they didn't do their laundry in this world because they're too wealthy, they surely don't want to do the laundry or the dishes in the next world. So they had made, in this Greek word, eushopti, describing what this uh, item, this, this statue, would do. And it would say, like, here am I, and it's written on the eushopti in hieroglyphs uh, about what this would do. When the deceased calls for you, you should say, here I am. And you would do the bidding of your master. Now, what's interesting about some of these eushoptis, when I came to Israel and I saw them on the market, I asked, well, where were they from? And the dealer told me they were from Hebron, which is just a few miles south of Jerusalem. But I noticed that they had yellow sand, little, kind of like yellow sea sand that was encrusted on it. I didn't say yellow snow, it was yellow sand. And that's an indication that it was from near the sea. All right? It didn't come from he Hebron. It, they were somewhere close to the sea by identifying this item. Also sold on the antiquity market was this funerary, funerary stone, also from Darabala. So you think somebody has been digging in the sand and finding these items and bringing them to their antiquity market, and they were being sold, all right? This is a coffin lid. We're going to take a look at a real one here in a few minutes. But what would happen is, is that the Egyptians were a long way from home, but they wanted to practice their customs of, you could say, uh, a realistic anthropomorphic lifestyle coffin, all right, with a human head on it and some body features. So it's called anthropoid terracotta coffin because they didn't have wood that they were using. They used clay. And they formed these very large clay coffins, um, a little bit bigger than the individual that was deceased. And they placed them in the coffin, then also uh, some of their grave goods, like his jewelry, combs, rings, would be placed in there with them. Moshe Diane, a uh, general during the 1960s, 50s, um, did some, I'm going to be nicer, did some excavating around 1968 in the Gaza Strip area, and he also found in the dunes some of these anthropoid coffins. The Israel Museum has a selection of these on display at this time. Now, this is a selection of anthropoid coffins, but they're just the lids. So what happened is that these coffins were way too big for uh, these better ones to take to the antiquity market. So what did they take to the antiquity market? But the lid, it had a like, human face to it, anthropomorphic face. I found a few of these, um, not on the market, but actually in a home of an antiquity dealer in New York, New York City around the 1990s. I'm going to share with you, uh, with, with you one of those. How do we also date this find of the Gaza, during the Gaza Strip area, this dig of Dera Bala? Once again, it's the artifacts. What we have here is a cup, but we also have two canteens, which we call pilgrim's flask. These date to the late Bronze Age, 1550 to 1200 BC. So that's going to include the 18th and 19th dynasty of Egypt. Here we have a lo local Bedouin, Hamad, who was helping the archaeologists locate, well, at least he was showing them how he located, some of these items that hit the antiquity market. He was using a long screwdriver to find these amphoras that were situate, situated at the head of these anthropomorphic coffin lids. So when his uh, screwdriver would hit the terracotta, it'd make a different sound than when it would just go into the sand. When they started to excavate their Abala, what they actually found was underneath layers and layers of sand, about 2,000 years of six levels of occupation. Now, just to look at this chart, we can see the, the item on the very bottom with the little blue lines. That is the period of the Armana period, so it's 18th dynasty. Above that, we go into the late Bronze Age amphora. A little bit above that, we got a Mycenaean amphora, ancient Greek amphora. And it'd probably be late Bronze Age, 13th, 12th century, or uh, 13th, 12th century, that'd be good. And then we have a, um, a Philistine vessel, a bichrome, meaning more than one color. Uh, then we have an Iron Age, looks like crater. Then above that is uh, a Byzantine amphora. So this is going to date possibly from the early Bronze Age, 15th, 14th, 13th century BCE 
to the uh, time period of the Byzantines, so we can say 5th, 6th, possibly 7th century AD. So it was quite an extensive site, a lot of things to find. What did they use to start the dig? But of course, something you never use, a bulldozer. And it removed 175, uh, 175,000 metric tons of sand, and it was actually situated really close to an orange grove. So you're trying to avoid the orange grove while you're moving all the sand away from the excavation site. Here you see some uh, workers from Tel Aviv University actually painstakingly on their hands and knees, slowly removing the sand, what is going to be, what we're going to find, an anthropomorphic coffin. So they slowly excavate their way around this coffin, terracotta coffin, with a small dental tool. So you know that's going to take quite a long time. Now once we get to the, to the coffin where we can actually remove the lid, we notice that it dates to the 14th century. Okay, it has an Egyptian wig and also has cross arm design, very similar to the way the mummies were uh, situated in Egypt. But the, the coffin also contains something very special. It contained two adults, two children. Um, so some scholars believe that since so many individuals were buried in this anthropomorphic coffin, it was probably some kind of plague that hit. This coffin was uh, named Romeo and Juliet simply because we have two uh, skeletal structures, one male, one female, in this coffin. But we also have different types of items that were found. Um, you can barely see them in this photograph, but I'm going to show you items very, very similar to this. No trace of mummification used, just skeletons. So no mummy, mummy wrappings. When we start to take these items uh, out of that archaeological dig, uh, the anthropomorphic coffin in situ, it means the place of its origin, and they start to remove the bones and also the grave goods. They found an al alabaster goblet, a cosmetic spoon, bronze platter, and also gold jewelry, and of course, a mirror. So it looks like they want to take all their cosmetic stuff with them. That was probably the woman's. Okay, we have carnelian seals. These date to the time period of Ramses II. So we have 18th and also 19th dynasty. So we can think it's going to be 1550 to 1200 BC. Terracotta uh, fertility idols. Of course, they did worship fertility uh, images in the ancient culture, the Egyptians and both the Canaanites. Uh, also, we look at the building material. The building material that they used dates to the 14th, which is 14th century, which is the 18th dynasty. And also the, the uh, latter part of the, uh, the 13th or early part of the 13th century, which is the 19th dynasty. So we're going to say possibly Thutmose III to the time of King Tut or Akhenaten and possibly the beginning of the 19th dynasty with uh, Ramses I. Sete I and Ramses the Great, which is Ramses the Second. Here we have a close-up of some of these fertility idols. I just call them the idol pleasures. And here we have a little picture of an Egyptian-style spinning bowl. All right, you can see where he's got the uh, the, uh, the, the uh, fabric uh, woven through the holes, and you can see pieces of jars that uh, that were found. So here's a picture of what those bowls would look like if they were intact and what they were used for. In the Israel Museum, they have a large selection of these anthropomorphic coffins. You can see how they are heavily fragmented, but they are also pieced together and separated from their, you can say, coffin lid. So you can easily see where the lid was applied to each one of these um, anthropomorphic coffins. They're extremely heavy. They're sometimes like uh, over an inch thick. Um, they can range from five foot to even almost over six feet. So this is the location of Darabala. Why is this so important to us in archaeology? Well, during the 18th and 19th dynasty, this is the time what we call the New Kingdom period. And also, it, uh, it is the time where many scholars believe we have the traditional exodus of the Hebrews out of Egypt. Or do you believe in a large exodus or a small Exodus. Scholars think it's either the 18th or 19th dynasty. Most scholars believe it's the 19th dynasty, the time of Ramses II. Uh, because of a stela, you can look this up. It's called the Merneptah stela or the Israelite stela, 
which states that Israel is conquered, they are no more, and it dates to around 1208 BCE. Of course, the Egyptians like to brag. They're still around, aren't they? So let's go over to the room of a thousand artifacts. I'm going to share with you a number of artifacts, very, very similar to what was found at Darabala. Who knows? Maybe some of them are actually from that location. Okay, I think one of my favorite items from Darabala, possibly from Darabala, is a sickle sword. These are extremely rare. I actually got this on loan from the Museum of Archaeology and Biblical History. And you can see that it's got a design on the handle, very similar to what was found in King Tut's tomb. So King Tut dates to the end of the 18th dynasty. So we can place this around possibly 1330 um, BC, and it is possibly 18th dynasty. Once again, when I saw these at the antiquity market, they actually said these items were from Hebron, possibly, south of Jerusalem. But because some of the Ushaptis were covered with this yellow colored sand, um, most scholars would place this along the coast. Um, when we read the Bible during the time period after the Exodus, we really don't hear too much about the Egyptians, especially during the time period, the judges. And it could be that they are the, the Hebrews are inland, of course, along what we call the Patriarchal Highway, and uh, the Egyptians are still along the coast. They want to rule, they want to control the trade route. So where do I think these items were from? Uh, actually, possibly from the Levant, along the Way of Horus. What else do we have? We have a little cuneiform tablet. Not everybody's going to write in hieroglyphs. The Canaanites, along with Mesopotamian peoples, they use what we call cuneiform, means wedge-shaped cuneiform. There was a cache of cuneiform tablets uh, found in the ruins of King Tut's father, Akhenaten, called Akhenatenville, the Tel El Armana letters. And it describes some of the uh, commentary between the Pharaoh and his vassals that were controlling the cities or the small city-states in the land of Canaan. And it seems like they are being overrun, attacked, harassed by a, a group of people that we call living on the fringe of society, and they are called the Haperu. We don't know who these Haperu really are. Some su suspect that could this be the Hebrews? Uh, could be. Now let's look at some of these Ushaptis. Here's a small Ushapti. What is it made out of? It's made out of a substance called faience. His hands are crossed. There are no hieroglyphs on this particular one. It's probably from uh, an individual that couldn't afford it. So, but yes, they want their Ushaptis because why? Because they have to have a servant in the afterlife, somebody that's going to do their bidding. All right. Now, here's another style of Ushapti. This dates from the Hellenistic period, so around 300 BC. Once again, it's made out of faience. But during different time periods, the style of Ushaptis do change. It has a few little hieroglyphs on it. Now, this one is one of my favorites, very large Ushapti. It actually has on it the prayer, or we call it the Ushapti prayer from the Egyptian Book of the Dead. So really scary, huh? The Egyptian Book of the Dead. If you look on the back, it's lots of details. His hands are crossed. you got the Egyptian fake beard. That's not how they grew their beards. It's fake. Egyptians were clean-shaven. So if it looks like they got hair, it's usually uh, attached. It's, it's a fake beard and also a fake wig. All right? So Egyptian Ushapti. And lots of little fine hieroglyphs on this. So it's a really cool item. What does it say? Usually, once again, uh, it has a... A prayer from the Egyptian Book of the Dead to help the deceased cross over, but also it would have a prayer which would bring the Ushapti to life, to bring it to life. Um, these were, once again, over like 300 of them placed in some tombs so that when the, the individual went to the afterlife, he could call on his Ushapti to do all his bidding for him. Let's take a look at some other items, such as this right here. Here we have a wing scarab and the four sons of Horus. How do we find these? Well, usually, I'm going to show you a picture right here. 
It's a sketch or a print that's been colored in that dates to around the 1820s. So it's been around quite a bit, but it shows you how these items were placed on a mummy. Now then you also see this little like checkerboard pattern. Those are Ushapti beads. And I'll show you what Ushapti beads look like. Because when, you could say, uh, a Bedouin would break into a tomb, these beads are no longer attached. The cord that uh, kept them together has long rotted away, so they're gonna find thousands and thousands of these little, what we call, faience beads, and they would sell them on the market by making little necklaces like this. And they would get one of the amulets, so it has something more decorative on it. This has the Eye of Horus. And once again, it's faience. It's one style of necklace. Here's another style. It looks like there's a tooth, doesn't it? It looks like a little tooth. Actually, it's a four-horn altar. That reminds you of what we read about in the Old Testament. And they would sacrifice or burn incense, uh, burn incense on the altars. It talks about also how somebody that had actually um, had an uh, offense brought on them that they could go to the altar and grab one of the horns on the altar. Okay? So very interesting. Even though it looks like a molar, it's not. Let's see all what else. When they opened the sarcophagus anthropomorphic coffin, of Romeo and Juliet, what did they find? Cosmetics, cosmetics. Here we have a faience ring with a little baboon on it. The baboon and also the Egyptian bird, which is called the Thoth. So we've got Thoth Moses, represents writing and wisdom. Here we have a baboon. It's also a cosmetic applier. They might put some eyeshadow on with this. This is made out of fans, so you have a nice little baboon. It's a very cool piece from antiquities. Now, this is what a mirror looks like back then. This is actually a silver mirror. They would have to polish it to see even the slightest of reflections. In the New Testament, I believe the Apostle Paul says, we look dimly into the mirror. Well, you could understand. At that time, mirrors were kind of blah but this is the best they had. You can think they highly polished these to put their mascara on. Also, we have a little palette. It's got one, two, three, four, five with decoration. And these five, you could say, uh, depressions, concavities, would have different types of makeup. Maybe they would put powder and then add a little water and then apply the makeup. Egyptians loved it. And so did the Romans. The Romans... Use a lot of red, a lot of rouge. All righty. Next, what do we have? This came off of an idol. This was a headpiece right here. And there's actually a larger one in the collection about this big. We have a little snake right here, a cobra. And this is an ostrich feather. Ostrich feather. Once again, they're attached to a statue of an Egyptian idol. We'll just leave it like that. Here's a little bronze statue of Osiris. This was the guardian of the underworld. A little bronze Osiris. You can see once again his little fake beard. His arms are crossed. Then we also have some different types of amulets. It looks like four Egyptian deities, on, uh, three Egyptian deities on this little piece right here. This would also be worn on a necklace. Doesn't this look familiar? The Apis bull. Remember the event where they actually built themselves a, a calf and they were going to worship the calf. But they came out of Egypt and the Egyptians worshiped the Apis bull. Here we have a little, what we call, heart scare. This was actually inside the mummy, all right? So what happens during the turn of the century, when um, these mummies were found, they would just unwrap them or tell them, tear them apart, take off the amulets, 
and sell these on the antiquity market. And there are thousands and thousands of different amulets that you can find in the, on the antiquity market. Now, since we can identify the 18th dynasty by looking at different types of artifacts that date to the late Bronze Age period, 1550 to 1200 BC, also an Egyptologist is going to look at the little scarabs. This is once again made out of faience, but these scarabs look like little beetles, but on the back might have the cartouche. It's a, you could say, a, an oval design with hieroglyphs in the middle telling us who this seal belonged to or maybe a position in government. Faience, there's another style of faience dating to the Hyksos period. This would attach to a ring. They'd wear it on their finger or maybe as jewelry. Ah, last but not least, this is a very, very small anthropomorphic coffin lid for a child. The Egyptians love their children just like you and me love ours. I know the Egyptians seem like they're mean people in the Bible, but that's the way the Bible depicts them. They're the adversaries at that time. So this is one of the coffin lids sold in the, on the antiquity market. I brought this one here with me because it's so small, because the larger ones are heavy, and they're just and they can easily be broken. So I thought I'd share this with you once again. Even though it's a child's sarcophagus lid, we know it's Egyptian. Look at the fake beard and the, and the wig. So items, possibly a few of these, okay, were found at Darabala, an Egyptian outpost along the Levant, along the trade route, which we would call the Way of Horus, and at the times of Jesus, the Way by the Sea, the Via Mars. Well, thank you very much. I'm glad that I was able to share these items with you. Hope you had a great time. I did. Thank you very much. Bible Interact, uncovering the mysteries of the kingdom of God. At BibleInteract.tv, you will penetrate the scriptures of the Bible. At our store, you're just one click away from owning your favorite books, DVDs, or study guides. Earn a degree from our university and watch hundreds of video presentations from biblical scholars, archaeologists, and theologians. By subscribing to Bible Interact, you'll find all the resources you'll need. So why not subscribe today? Go to www.BibleInteract.tv. You'll be glad you did. Interested in studying more about the temple, the Messiah, or what God's plan is for our future? No problem, we've got you covered. With more than 200 DVDs, books, and workbooks, you'll find the answers you've been searching for. Bible Interact, uncovering the mysteries of the kingdom of God.